and communicate your heart and your mind to us. Give us the mind of Christ as we search the scriptures together. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start in 1 Peter tonight, but I want to connect a little bit of what we were talking about in Genesis 16 and how the Jewish people did something that distinguished them from all other people, and that is going into strange lands and keeping their culture. In fact, David in one of the Psalms said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? And for 2,000 years, they did that. And First Peter, in his opening few verses, he talks about those who are scattered. But he was writing to not just a Jewish audience, but a Gentile audience. And you know, Peter, as the chief apostle, was sent to the Jews, and Paul was sent to the Gentiles. But when they were scattered under the rule of Nero, Nero, who was a Roman emperor who did not like the way, and people who followed Jesus were in the way. They followed the way. And there was state sponsored idolatry. And you'll hear Peter as we go through in one of the chapters talk, refer to Babylon, Babylon. And depending on which scholar, there's some who says he's using that as a metaphor for Rome because Rome is doing what Nebuchadnezzar did to those who were taken into captivity. They had to bow to his God or else, unless you're Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. Um, and then others say um, that it was literally in the region of ancient Babylon, which was today we know as Turkey. So whether it's referring to a land or a place, which I think is less likely, since they're scattered, I think they're calling their captivity spiritually to be uh, an, an analogy or analogous to Babylon. Now, we, were, we talked a lot about what's happening in the Middle East. I want to just say one thing about that connected to the scripture and also to our times. Sometimes well-meaning people get caught up in things that they really don't understand and they say things, which is very common today in what many call a post-Christian era in America. Like secular humanism is more widely dispersed than the true gospel. And so a lot of things are watered down and things that people say, like one of the words that was very common in the church was to manifest or to make manifest. I'm careful to use it because in secular humanism, talking about manifesting abundance or manifesting what you want is common. It's the same word, but a different meaning. And people who don't have the foundation that we have, they follow it and they don't know better. So for example, on all these college campuses, and it's close to us, Drexel now is closed down. In fact, I thought I, about calling Arutus today. I think they decided to, they're gonna let the encampment stay, but they're asking them to leave. They're not gonna force them to leave, but they're back in class. Did you know that they were doing remote learning because of the, um, the veracity of the protest? 
And from Columbia to Drexel to Penn and everywhere, the students have this chant, from the river to the sea. And I know that they don't mean what they're saying because they don't know what they're saying. What they're saying is an ideological chant of Hamas. Their hearts are for the innocent Palestinians that are dying, but they're taking on the ways of terrorists. They don't know that they're supporting Hamas when they say that. And if you're a Jewish person and you hear it, what they're saying is annihilate all Jews. That's their way of saying we want every Jew dead from the river to the sea. So imagine if you're a student on campus and you are a Jewish professor or student and you hear that. What kind of response is that going to elicit? And will you feel safe? They're not thinking about it in that way, but that's what they're doing. Are you following me? I know that their hearts are tender because they see dead children. They don't want that, but they're taking on the ways of something that they don't understand. Peter is writing this letter to the saints who are scattered under the same conditions. There's nothing new under the sun. It's more subtle today. Thank God in America there's not state or government sanctioned idolatry. It's not that kind of persecution. But if you are in the school district, how many people in the school district? Are you still in the school district? No? You said, no, I was. You was? Okay, for those of you who were, if you went in every morning and you kneeled down and prayed and you had your Bible open on your desk, would, you, would that be okay? Yeah, in your office. Yeah, before starting time. You could do a Bible study before starting time or at lunch, but did you, maybe, but did you have freedom to do that? Hmm? You did? Is that right? She said the superintendent came to her, huh? Okay. That's uncommon. Um, and I'm, the reason I bring that up is the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael going to pray. I don't care what you say. I've been leaving the Philadelphia airport, and I see a line of cabs. And they have their mats down, and they're on their face praying. Praying. It's a common thing. In the school district, this past Ramadan, Ramadan, they made provisions for them to pray. You know why? Because Hagar said, I want my son to be heard. And we're a little more, let's go with the flow, we're supposed to pray in our closets, right? <laughs> We're going to go in the closet. So there is a difference. And really the point I wanted to make is sometimes people take positions for good reasons, but they know not what they do and they don't know what they're saying. So when I hear them saying that, I know their intent isn't to embrace Hamas but they don't understand what they're saying. Secular humanism is like that. And there are a lot of things that are out there that creep into the church, and we have to make certain that they don't creep in unaware. You know how I normally write questions? I didn't do that tonight. I'm gonna to start with a broad one, which is somewhat connected to what I just talked about, how things can get watered down. How many religions are there, in the, like distinct, religions in the world today, in 2024. There are three major, but there are four top religions that 75% of the world follows, four top. And one of the major religions isn't one of them. And the reason why is logical. The Jewish population makes up 0.2%, probably more zeros than that, of the world's population. 
so in volume it wouldn't rank. There are 10,000 distinct religions. 10,000. There's one God. People are confused, and only three of them say there's one God. So the other 9,997 are polytheistic, multiple gods. So most of the people in the world are confused, very confused. And I want to talk about this a little more, not the numbers, but on Sunday. The question is going to be, who are we? Because we don't want to be just lumped in religion. We're more than that. Religion has been institutionalized, and people are religious, but they don't know God. Religious, but don't know God. Some of them don't even regard God. So what are the top four? What's number one? It's Christianity. 31% um, Christianity. What's number two? Not enough people. Islam, 24%. What's next? India. India. Hinduism, 15%. What's next? China. Buddhism. It's interesting, too. China is a communist nation, which means they're anti, they're hostile towards religion, but they embrace Buddhism. How, how is that so? Buddha, isn't that a religion? Russia is a communist nation, but they embrace the church, type of the church. You know why? Because Putin controls the church. The war, the, the decision to go into Ukraine, he met with church leaders. They sit and they sanction it. And you know how that looks to the rest of the world? That this is God's thing. But who's deciding? Is it God? Is it the priest? It's Vladimir Putin. And that's why there are some people who say religion is just to control the mind. But not the God that we serve. It is to obey him. Did you have your hand up, Nova? Yeah. yeah, I was going to say for a lot of countries that claim a religion like China, it's their culture, it's not their faith. Right. Same thing in Israel. Right. Israel is different, though, because they're secular, as we talked about, but the word of God came to them first on the Mount of Sinai. And their blindness, as we learned in Roman, is in part for us, right, until the fullness of the Gentile comes in. So the same God who promised them is the God who we trust to keep his promise to us. Okay, last thing I want to say is by the year 20, 2060, Islam will be number two but close to Christianity. Christianity will go from 31% to 32%. Islam will grow from 24 to 30. Why do you think that is? See, that would be the first place I would go to, and that's in part evangelizing because they're open, right? If, if I go, um, I was at a track meet last Thursday, and I could tell most of the Muslims because of the way they dressed. Even the ones, the young ladies who ran, they had on their hijab, 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 had it right the first time. They had it on, and when they ran, I could tell that's a Muslim. If, if a young lady's a Christian, I couldn't identify her like that. The men, they were wearing um, the tunics. They had on their tunics, and the women, had on their headdress. By appearance, you know them, but you, their heart, you can't see. A Christian, if you observe them and you talk to them, you know if they're a believer, right? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
So it's not just the evangelizing. I think that's a part of it. They're aggressive. It's fertility. It's fertility. Because in Muslim nations, there is no such thing as abortion. Not one. Because they, they determine everything. That's, that's a religious state. So I talked about state-sponsored um, idolatry. State-sponsored religion is very, very controlling, right? Especially on the women. The men have the rights, they do everything. Women have very few, education, healthcare, anything. So when they're violated in a place like that, where do they go? They have nowhere to go. So that part is something that uh, God is able to change history. It may, th this is Pew Research projecting could be different, but that's the projection right now. The top two by far will be Islam and Christianity. Christianity holds pretty steady. All right, let's get into 1 Peter now with that backdrop. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 reads, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. So they're dispersed in Pontus, Pontus, Galidia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Paul writes to many of them also, the church of Galidia, etc. That's how uh, that confirms what I said up front. He's not only writing to a Jewish audience, but also a Gentile audience. And that'll be made more uh, clear as we read the text, you can see he's appealing to people who are outside of just the uh, Judeo faith. Asia and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. His greeting is intended to encourage those who are under fiery persecution. Uh, this is a time that the scattering was driven by persecution. This is when Nero was feeding them publicly to the lions and putting them on stakes and burning them. Burn it like that was sport. People would come to the Colosseum and that was sport. There were people who were idol worshipers who were okay because that's what Nero wanted. But for the people who followed Jesus Christ, their lives were at risk. And you'll see in the epistle, Paul talks to them about identifying with his suffering. He talks a lot about our eternal hope. Can you imagine if you live in a time and in a place where your life is constantly at risk because of your faith? If you don't have genuine faith, Rita, it could cause you to turn. I heard a story, I may have told this before, I hope it's an original for this audience. In, during the Cold War, the KGB found an underground church and they went in with their long guns while people were worshiping. And they said, renounce your God. I need you to renounce Jesus Christ right now. And if you do, you can go. If you don't, get ready to meet your maker. You die. So you have a room full of people. They're underground, and they have been worshiping for a while. Now they're confronted with the KGB. And they said, one last chance. Renounce him or die. 
Some of them got up, they renounced, and they walked out. Probably didn't even do this. <laughs> they, just, they just walked out. <laughs> they walked out. And then looked around at the other people, said, this is your last chance. Will you renounce your God, or are you ready to die? And they said, we will not renounce him. We will die before we renounce him. And they put the guns down. And they said, we just want to worship with some true believers. And they began to worship together. Can you imagine if you were those who left and later they told you about it? You would feel worse than Peter when he denied him. What Peter understood because he denied him at the cross was what it was like to be persecuted. Although Peter had been beaten, had been put in jail, that happened after he, re he renounced him. He renounced him when Jesus was the one suffering and he was not. So the language that he uses, you'll understand that a lot of that is from, it's obviously from the spirit because all scripture is God breathed, but it's because of his personal experience with God and he knows if he could take that moment back, he would have. But before he did it, didn't Jesus tell him he was going to do it? And he believed his own self more than the word of God. That's another mistake Peter never made again. Let's go to verse 3. Now he's focused on their heavenly inheritance. So he, what he's trying to do is he understands their present suffering, but he wants their focus to be on their inheritance so they can endure. Because you have to endure hardness. You have to persevere through persecution. And so this text is designed to help them. If, did we, re, did we get all the way to verse five? Three, okay, good. Not good. Let's go to verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. They're worrying about dying. He's saying, no, we have a living hope. There is nothing they can do to take away your living hope because of the sacrifice of our Lord. All they can do is um, kill your body, but then you're going to be free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. So he's sending them a word of encouragement when they're out of their land. They're no longer in Jerusalem. They're no longer in Judea. They're scattered across the known world at that time. According to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You heard that text. You know they're suffering. What is Peter doing? What do you think when they read this epistle, this does for them? I know, I know. I saw your lips moving. So I want to give you the mic. And you said oh, something good. It builds them up. It builds them up. It builds them up. Encourage them. It encourages them. And what does it do about their focus on the present circumstances? That's right. Set your affection on things above and not beneath. Because the things that are seen are what? Are temporal. 
the things that are not seen. So he's using different words to say the same thing that Paul said. So what he's doing is saying, if he knows, if you constantly focus on that and you feel the pressure of that, you might be like one of those who denounce him and walk away. He focuses on faith. He focuses on eternity. He focuses on what's waiting for them. And again, Peter, with his experience at the cross, even though he didn't suffer a lick, at the threat of suffering a lick, he said, I don't know him. Somebody else asked him, he started to curse and to swear. I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, the young lady said, your speech testifies against you. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I never met that dude. What's his name? <laughs> but the reason he has the courage and the compassion to write what he's writing, because as Jesus was bleeding his, from his head, his face, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah Revella said his visage, his face, his appearance was so marred, he did not have the image of a man. He didn't look like, like one of the most heart-wrenching images I've ever seen, and it wasn't even in person, was the image of Emmett Till. Because of how deformed he looked, Jesus was worse than that. Was worse than that. So Peter, knowing that and having that image and knowing he hadn't even been touched, the threat of it caused him to do that. He wanted to make certain that none of them, none of them had to feel what he felt, the regret that he felt, the personal disappointment that he felt. But when Jesus looked at him, he didn't say a word. He looked at him with forgiving eyes that caused Peter to weep bitterly, and he repented. And from that point on, it was never. He took the beatings. In fact, when him and John got beat by the Sanhedrin because they were teaching in Jerusalem, they began to rejoice. They said, they rejoice because we're worthy to suffer in his name. He went from denying them at the threat of being beaten to rejoicing after being beaten. And that's what the love of God will do. And what he's trying to do is let them know that that same Jesus is with you. You are kept by the power of God and no one can pluck you out of his hands. And when we are in a tough spot, we need to be reminded that we're kept by the power of God. And there's nothing that can threaten us if he has us in his hand. What can separate us from the love of God? Can life or death, power or principalities, angels or peril or sword, things present or things to come? There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And where is it found? In Christ Jesus. Those who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. He's telling them to rejoice. Has their persecution changed? Has the threat gone away? Has the environment changed? No. Nope. But he's saying, because of the hope that is before you, you need to greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. I would to God that we would take something from this to be able to give to others who are in trouble. Because these words are encouraging me even as I'm reading them, as we are together. Because you can imagine being in a tough spot and the word of God coming to lift you up so that you can be in trouble, but you don't have to be troubled. You can be in trouble and you don't have to be troubled. See, that's what it means to have peace that passes all understanding. 
and it comes by the word of God because the word, every time we take in the word, it builds up our faith. Faith comes by and hearing by, by the word of God, by the word of God. So this is not, we're not reading a novel, we're, we're reading the living word. That the genuineness of your faith, the genuineness of your faith. Do you know how we know how genuine our faith is? When we're tested. When we're tested. You really, you really don't know until you're tested. And the greater the test, the more refined we are. Refining happens in the fire. Hot, hot fire. Do you know how a silversmith knows that the silver is ready to come out of the fire? When he sees his image in it. God knows we're ready to come out of the fire when he sees his image in us. Bobby, I'm going to leave you in that fire until you look like me. Sometimes we're trying to get away from something that God is refining us in. The silversmith knows the silver is ready to come out of the fire and is pure when he sees his image. God knows it's time to pluck us out of the fire when he sees his image. I don't know about you, I want to look like him. I want to talk like him. I want to act like him. I want to be like him. And it doesn't happen on a bed of ease. It doesn't. Because ease opens us up to temptation. It causes us to think more of ourselves than we ought to. But there's something about God's way that's the best way. It may not feel like the best way, but he knows best. It is the best way. When we come forth, Come on, pure gold, pure gold. Where did I stop? Though you are tested by fire. You see your faith, though it is tested by fire. I got ahead of myself just a little bit, but I think it was a good thing to run ahead just a minute. May be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, what you're going through now, if you go through it with genuine faith, when he's revealed, when he's come, it's gonna be praise and honor and glory. If you wilt and you shrink and you jump out of the fire before you're refined, you're gonna see him but there won't be praise and honor and glory. Doesn't Paul tell us that every one of our works are gonna be tried by what? By fire. And if it's wood, hay, and stubble, what's gonna happen? It's gonna burn up. But if it's gold and silver, what's gonna happen? It even gets better with the fire. Some things are consumed in the fire. Some things get better in the fire. That's why our faith needs to be genuine. That's why the more word we get, the more faith. What are the two ways scripture says we build up our faith? One we already got, the word, right? What's the other? That's it. Praying in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. Who said that? No, not in the room, in the Bible. <laughs> who said, who was, it was Minister Louise Sample who said that. I know my question was like, <laughs> who in the Bible said that? It's a book that is the most powerful one chapter. I just gave you a clue, one chapter in the Bible, Jude. Build up your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. So prayer and the Word gets us that genuine faith. 
And that way we can stay in the heat and we don't have to get out of the kitchen. Verse 8 and then, good, we have two comments. No, you can, you can stay there. My comment is um, when we are going through hard times and difficult situations, the first thing a lot of times we'll say is, why me, Lord? And I think this scripture will help us to say, thank you, Lord, mm. that you count me worthy to be here. Just like Peter was saying, thank you, Lord, that you trust me to be able to go through this and I will lean on you to get through it. And I, we, we was visiting with someone tonight and hard times, hard, hard, difficult situation. And the encouragement was God's going to take you through. And, and they, were, they were saying, I know I'm going to get through this. Mm. Difficult situation, but leaning on the Lord, I'm going to make it through this. Amen. Amen. And we can have confidence like that because... His word is true. He will never put more on you, finish it, than you can bear. She said it? Come on, say it again. You might say it different. I was just going to say that when we're going through the fire, that we are the ones of silver and the gold. We're going to reflect to God. But if we jump out the fire, like she said, then one, we, we don't get to go all the way through at that time. We get don't get the um, honor. And then we got to go back again. Go back. That's, see, that's the other part. See, I'm glad you said it. Because God is going to make sure that we get through it. So we're going to keep going through that same fire, that same test until we pass it. So one thing is to have faith to go through it and the patience to be with God to get through it. And why do we go through it again? That's rhetorical. Because if you jump out, you're unrefined. And he's the refiner. He wants to refine us. And sometimes he'll put us on the potter's wheel. We are the potter and he is the clay. And he's shaping us and molding us after his will and after his way. And then there are other times he puts us in the fire. After all Job went through, it took him, I don't know how many chapters, but too many. I'm measuring it by chapters. Until he said, when he has tried me, Job, you just figured out this was a test because he had miserable friends who would tell him he had sinned. And he's listening to them rather than talking to God. He said, I shall come forth as what? As pure gold. I hope we can discern the test sooner than Job. And you know one of the indicators is to have the right people around you because Illifad, and, and Bildad and those guys were telling Job, God doesn't do this to people who walk up right. Job, you know you're a sinner. Just admit it. Oh, and his wife. That foolish woman. Job said that. He, sound, he said, you sound like. He didn't call her foolish. You sound like a foolish woman. And then he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And right after that, the Bible said he worshiped. He just lost everything and he worshiped. He was doing good until his friends came. <laughs> like seriously, am I right? Am I making that up? When it was just his wife, he corrected her. He spoke a word to honor God and then he worshiped. And then they sat around. And I know they meant well because they sat there for seven days in silence, just looking at him. And when they started talking, they took turns, telling him about his mess, and instead of encouraging him. I'm sorry to jump back out there. Uh, I, was, I was thinking when you said, going through the fire. I'm not sure which is worse, going through the fire, being on the potter's wheel, or being put in all... Uh. <laughs> Yeah, and pruning. Jesus said, I'm the vine and my father is the husband man. He's the husband man. He does the pruning. He takes care of the garden. Which of the three, based on the scripture, 
Which of the three does God show the least patience? He's always patient, but I'm saying the least. Refiner's fire, potter's wheel, or pruning? Yep, pruning. Because in the scripture, Jesus says there's a couple things. First, every, the ax, John the Baptist said this, the ax is laid to the, to the tree. And everyone that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut down and put in the fire. Not for refining, but for consumption. For consumption. And then he says, Jesus tells a parable about pruning. He said his father prunes and he looks for fruitfulness. And if it doesn't bring forth fruit, it's cast into the fire. So we don't escape fire, but one fire of God is consuming and one is refining. I want the refining one. <laughs> because pruning doesn't feel good. It's taking stuff off. It's plucking stuff up. So those three things, which is good. I like the questions here that are not premeditated are pretty good because they all lead to something. None of this, none of these questions were scripted. What verse did I stop at, Key? The one that's up, eight. Whom have not, whom having not seen, you love. That's another way of saying your expression of faith. You haven't seen him, but you love him. See, I've seen him, and I love him. You haven't seen him. Which one does Jesus say is more blessed? And John, that's right. Thomas, have you now, do you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. That's what Peter is saying to them. He's speaking exactly what the Lord said to them when they were despondent and discouraged and afraid and hiding and fishing until he was resurrected. And even when Mary and the women came and told them they didn't believe it, they said, I'm not going to believe until I see him. It wasn't, it wasn't just one of them. They all said it. And then he showed up. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, here we go again, you rejoice with joy inexpressible. How does James say it? Unspeakable and full of glory and full of glory. You think James and Peter collaborated? Their verses are very close. Swap one word. It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Hold on, let me get it for you. I've been doing it on the other side. I gotta be a balanced weight. Hold on, it's on. So that, that is the end of your faith, um, the salvation of the end of your faith. In last Thursday, um, what he was talking about, the salvation of your soul. Mm-hmm. So he's talking to them in their present circumstance. He's speaking to them about a future occurrence, but is he saying to them that the salvation of your soul is already in the bag? Is that question clear? He's talking to them in their present suffering. He's getting them to look at a future state, but when he says this, the end is the salvation of your soul, is he saying it's already in the bag. No, we're being saved. The reason he's encouraging them is to stay in the faith. Because if we don't abide in him, that's what jumping out the fire is talking about. Go back to that verse. You, you read the verse correctly, but I'm saying, is Peter saying, where is it, the last line, the salvation of your souls? Verse 9, it must be verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So if I, 
if I took receiving, I'm receiving the end of my faith. Receiving. Does it say received or receiving? So what tense is receiving? Come on, that's good. The school district in the house is active. It's active. That's why I minister how Peter, the same Peter says, you work out your soul's salvation with fear and trembling. What he didn't want them to do is to say it's in the bag. So many people are shipwrecked and go astray because they say, I got it. I, I put my confidence in Jesus. They confess they know him, but in every work they deny him. In works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and reprobate to every good work. There's no security in that. He want, why call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say? If he's my Lord, I'm going to follow him and I'm going to do what he says. When you do that, you're receiving. See, I'm still receiving. Are you still receiving? Because if we, if we already got all we're going to get, we might as well go to sleep. We are receiving. Salvation is something that you work out, and you work it out with fear and trembling. You didn't say anything wrong. What I'm trying to do is get us to understand what he is saying. And when we see the text in its tense, and you put the first part and the second part together, you know he's not saying it's in the bag. He's saying stay the course. Keep doing it. Don't let the culture consume you. All this idolatry that's happening, don't fall into that because there's a promise waiting for you. There's a promise waiting for you. Even Jesus, the writer of Hebrews said that he endured the death of the cross because he was looking Come on, finish it. He endured it. Why? No, we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay, who said that? Point to Minister Louise again. <laughs> I know you didn't. I'm just keeping that joke going because I don't have any more. For his sister. You don't have another joke. <laughs> <laughs> you better talk to Bob Duckett. <laughs> but back on time. In our minds, think because God knows the end from the beginning, and we kind of like want to fall down on the job, but we still have to do the work. We have to do the work in between the end and the beginning. Because, again, I think I said this a couple weeks ago we're not robots, He gives us free will. Right. He knows already what you're going to do, He knows the end. Right. He set it aside so you would do, have the opportunity to do his will, but he is not going to make you do his will. That's right. You got to be obedient and humble and submit yourself. Can I tell you a quick story? It's, it's related. I think it drives home the point. Some years ago, huh? Oh, okay. You need the mic? No. Oh, she already answered it. Oh, no. She, they're trying to give me some more material. <laughs> so years ago, when I was a young minister in the gospel, I had a customer. I was a young, aspiring business person, but I was on fire for the gospel. And I was one of those people, I was a zealot, yeah. I, had, I was full of zeal. If I were back in Jesus' day, I would have been a zealot. <laughs> but I used to every day minister to this person. And one day I went in, he was very well educated, and he used to call me Solomon. That's what he called me, he said, because you have the wisdom of Solomon. So I liked him. <laughs> you can understand that, right? <laughs> and, and one day I went in, he looked sad, and he said, there's something I don't understand. God isn't fair. He said, I've heard about this predestination. If God has already determined who's going to be saved, what is the point? And I could tell, Rita, that he felt lost. So I let him go. 
And there was another person who was his assistant who used to look at me side-eyed before I knew what side I was. And when I would say something, she would grumble and say something. I'm like, I don't know why she act like that. She was almost always wrong. And I don't know if it was her who put that in his ear, but I listened patiently and I said, predestination does not override your free will. I said, you know that same verse that talks about predestination? You know what else it says? He looks at me. And I said, he's, it says, who he foreknew, he also predestined. So it's God's foreknowledge of who's going to obey him and who's not. So though the ones he knew, foreknew from the beginning to the end, he knows who's going to obey him. He knows who's going to backslide. He knows who's going to repent. He knows who's going to do their own thing, even though they say him, even though they confess him, they do their own thing. He knows all of that. God is fair. It's up to you and it's up to me. Those are the ones he appointed to salvation, who he foreknew, he predestined. And it's the foreknowledge. And not everybody understands that. And I think if I didn't come in there that day, he might have said, I may as well eat and drink because tomorrow we die. That's what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15 about people who just throw caution to the wind. He said, if we, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, he said, if Jesus didn't get up because there were people who were teaching the resurrection has already passed, you're done. He said, if that's the case, we are of all people most miserable. We may as well eat and drink, for tomorrow he die. we die. He said, but there is a resurrection. There's hope. And you saw he talked to them about the living hope in the what? The resurrection. In the resurrection. So, all right, we good? No? Get the mic. Hold on, let me give it to you. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And, and say that when, do, when does an individual become saved? Is that a, um, a past tense or present tense experience? Is that a experience that has to be Those that say that you can lose your salvation because you have not worked it out. So those persons that that you're not saved, if you believe in Jesus Christ, crucifixion, death, and resurrection, and 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 desire and live according to his precepts to the um, then there's still something else that you must do. I don't know who they are. I'm not one of them. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what he said. When he was talking about end times, he said, the love of many will wax cold, will grow cold. And nation will rise up against nation. And there'll be trouble as the world has never seen. He said, but the one who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That's what Jesus says. So it's about what Peter is talking about is endurance. He said, you're receiving the end of your faith. And as we go through 1 Peter, it's either in 1 or 2 Peter, but I think it's in 1. He's going to talk about working out your soul's salvation through fear and trembling. So what we are, this is not a sprint. It's endurance. So imagine a scenario where I come to the altar and I'm sincere. Lord, I love you. I receive you. You're my savior. And then I go out and I do the same things I've ever done. And I, I cheat on my wife. I do this. I do that. I do all those things. Am I saved? 
No, but so just because someone says they're saved, the evidence of salvation is in our abiding in him and obedience. Doesn't mean you can't stumble, but then you repent. A person who's unrepentant is a person who's out of him. You don't want to be found from the vine. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you. So it's not, I'm not talking about a theology or a doctrine that says that you're, you can lose your salvation. What I'm saying is we are free moral agents. We have free will. And God has predestined those who he foreknew to obey him until the end. It's the one who endures to the end, that's the one. According to Jesus, not according to me, the same. That one will be saved. So I'm, I want to make sure I understand what you're confu confused about. What is it in that text that you see that's different? Because what I try to do is only quote what the word says. But it sounds like you're struggling with something. We need to talk about this. Even if the time runs out, we'll get to the rest later. Put the mic up. Well, no, I, I'm to, to tell someone, and I'm interested to when I'm speaking to someone, and um, what, I, what, I, I'm, what I think I'm hearing in terms of tonight in, in this phraseology is that um, believing in Jesus Christ, confessing Jesus Christ, crucifixion, death, and resurrection, and to the best of their ability, living that out, because um, uh, that there's something else necessary for salvation. But not even to the best of their ability. See that? If you disciple someone, don't use that language. Okay. Has nothing to do with my ability or yours. He who know, knew no sin became sin for us. And in him, we're the righteousness of God. That's why we stay in him. So let's say this is Jesus, and I'm in him. In God's eyes, I'm righteous. I still claim him, but I'm now over here. Now I'm depending on myself. Am I righteous? No, because he's there. I got to be in him. I must abide in him. I don't care how hard I try, I can't do it. If anyone could keep the law, Jesus didn't have to die. Because if somebody could do it, everybody can do it. If somebody could do it, anybody could do it. But nobody could do it except him. He was tempted just like us, yet without sin. There's nobody ever lived who could say that. Not Moses, not Joshua, not Jeremiah, not Ezekiel, not Isaiah, not Elijah, not Elisha, not Esther, not Ruth, Naomi. None of them. He alone. He is our righteousness. So if I decide to do it on my own, Here's something else Paul said. There was a time he was speaking on Mars Hill to a group of people who had an inscription that said the unknown God. He said, that's the God I want to proclaim to you. He has revealed himself to all, through nature. He's made himself known. But he said, there was a time when that God winked at ignorance. But in these last days, he's calling everyone to what? to repentance. So if someone is saying that they're a Christian and they're living in unrepentant sin, they're in trouble because now they're, they're out there on their own. You got to be in him. That's what I'm saying. I'm not into, are you once saved, always saved? Can you lose your salvation? We work out our soul salvation. Salvation is not an event. It's a process. It's a process. And our whole life, our whole life, we're striving. That's why Paul said, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting about those things that are behind, I reach forth to that which is before me, pressing towards the mark of the prize. Why is Paul pressing if it's already done? I don't need to press if it's finished. I don't need us to press my suit if it don't have wrinkles. 
I need to press it when there's wrinkle. And Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. I want to be found in him because without him, I'm lost. That's what I'm saying. Is that clear? I want to make sure. Don't tell anybody to rely on themselves to try their hardest. We'll get nowhere trying. Well, no, 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 no. He finished. Somebody say, it is finished. I'm going to rely on the finished work of Jesus Christ, not work that I can't finish. I might not wake up tomorrow. And how am I going to finish then? Can't finish. Come on, who said that? Can't finish. <laughs> I wanted to comment on uh, my pressing on towards the mark is not in my own strength. It's right. the Holy Spirit in me enabling me as I walk by faith so that even the pressing is God's work. Come on. Come on. You're about to make me shout up in here. Even the press is not ours. Here, I, this morning I read this, not for the first time, but I think it's for this moment. Jesus said this to his disciples, talking about the kingdom. He said, the ki y'all looking for the kingdom? Remember I told you outwardly I could tell a Muslim if they're orthodox by their garb? He said the kingdom does not come by observation. The kingdom is within you, within you. So I want to make sure that what God has put in me stays in me and is right. He's given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. But if, if Jesus is here, and when I'm here, I'm in him, I'm good. Even my press, he's pressing. He's the presser. He's the presser that gives me the strength to press. But when I'm over here, I'm on my own. And I'm in my own strength. And unfortunately, there are people who are pious, who are self-righteous. Self-righteous. That's an oxymoron. Self right, because there's no righteousness in us. All of our righteousness, filthy rags. Uh, the righteousness of God is in Him. And I'm so glad that even though He knew no sin, He loved us so much that He became sin for us because the only way to deliver us, because God is holy, He must judge sin. Wherever it is. And he put it all on his son. And the whole world has an opportunity to come to him. But most of the people want to trust Buddha. Want to trust Buddha. Buddha never had a breath. Want to trust Confucius. At least he was alive, but now he's dead. I trust Jesus, who was dead and now is alive. And he lives forevermore. There's nobody like him. Come on, let's stand up together. I think this lesson is done. There ain't nobody like him. You can search all over. You won't find nobody like him. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Confucius, not Daddy Grace. Nobody. Nobody. Come on, Minister Sam, we'll close this thing. I'm get, it's getting hot in here. I want you to pray according to the Spirit and then give the benediction. I need some cool water. In, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, there was a, a scripture that you read that I thought about. It said, of course, here it is. I'm sorry. I think it was for. I know you're always ready. Okay. <laughs> um, it's said um, he will return again. And when I read that, to me it meant that he had to have done it before. So whatever you are going through, the press, God is there again. He's there again 
to take you through. Whether it's physical, sickness, emotional, God will return again. And in his returning, sometimes we could feel left alone. But he will return again. We have to abide. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that your word says that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Never. Never, never Lord. You will never leave us nor forsake us. The early saints were being persecuted for their faith. They were being killed for their faith. Lord, we are not being thrown into lion's dens. God, help us to stand for you wherever we are. On our job, even driving down the road when someone cut us off. Help us to stand for you. Lord, we are not being tortured like the early Christians. And Peter told them to hold on till the end. Help us tonight, dear Father, to hold on until the end. We don't have to go through like they went through to prove that we are Christians and we love you. What would we do if someone put a gun in our face and tell us to denounce Jesus? Mm. Will we not do it because we want to be with our children? But God, you ask us just to stand for you. Stand for righteousness. Stand for truth and not bend as the world is bending but stand for truth and righteousness. Tonight, God, we pray and ask you to forgive us when we didn't. Forgive us when we don't. God, strengthen us, dear Father, when our test comes that we can be fortified to pass it, whatever it may be, Whatever our test may be, help us tonight not to look to the left or to right, but look to the hills from which cometh our help, because our help cometh from you. We pray for Pastor Bob tonight, God. We pray that you will restore unto him the virtue that he has put out. God, give him time to just come aside and to rest. Sundays, spending long hours away from his family. Tuesdays, spending long hours. God, restore the virtue, the strength to him. The distance he has to drive. God, bless him. Allow goodness and mercy to follow him and keep him safe from all dangers, seen and unseen. Keep him alert. Bless his family, dear God. We thank you for them giving him, Lord, the freedom to do what he does. God, bless him tonight. Bless his family. Give them time together. Restore the times, Lord, that he is not there. Restore the time. And bless us all tonight as we leave. Cover us, preserve us, and defend for us, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen.